item on our agenda is we're going to finish with a conversation. And we're going to finish, so it's a panel. And our buddy Matt Hansen, you guys know Matt? Stand up, Matt. You come, come on over here. Get over here. Okay. Matt's the executive editor of Powder Magazine. He's been there since 2004, but uh, I think he's in the hot seat these days. Um, he's originally from Salt Lake, but Matt's been here since, gosh, 1998, so you've seen him around. Um, Matt's worked pretty hard, really hard, to put together this panel, and I'm going to let him introduce his panel members and his topic. Thanks, Matt. Last one of the day. Nice job. Thanks for everybody coming out. Um, thanks to Lynn and Stephanie for organizing all this. Um, this is a huge honor to be up here with such an incredible uh, group of speakers. And the thing that I love about this event is it's all about creating positive change in our community, and that alone is worth celebrating. So thanks, everybody. Um, but now I'm standing between you and your beer, so let's get started. Um, my panelists, if you guys are out there, please come on up. Um, and I'll just kind of frame this discussion as they're walking up, and then I'll give a few brief intros. Um, but this is a panel consisting of four people who have been caught in avalanches here in Jackson. And, you know, talking about avalanches and coming forward and, and speaking about it publicly is really hard. Um, there is the fear of being judged. Uh, you know, nobody wants to admit to their mistakes. And with the surge of online media, as we've seen, there can be some pretty hurtful backlash occasionally. You know, I, I feel like as we mature as backcountry skiers and online users, I think that, that is, that's starting to break down, which is a, a huge positive, because we need those personal stories. As we saw earlier and heard with Chip and Jim talking about their experience in Gothic, and um, that has so much meaning and so much value for us to learn about our own decision making in the backcountry and just allows us to be just better skiers and, and better community members. Um, so the goal of this panel is to bring that out in the open in a respectful way and talk about the lessons that, that um, these guys have learned and some of the things that they can impart to us and, and give us some wisdom so that we can improve our own uh, backcountry travel. Um, so I'll just kind of start to intro these guys. Uh, Jessica Ginter grew up skiing back east, and we just barely met. We actually haven't even really met so much, but thanks for being here, Jessica. Uh, she attended a year of college at the University of Utah and then moved to Jackson in 1993 to become a river guide and fell into the mountain lifestyle. Um, she was a baker at Betty Rock Cafe for about five years before going back to school at the University of Washington to get a degree in architecture. She moved back to Jackson in 2003, got a better job, became a mom, and now runs the, um, the Inside Design Studio in Victor. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, Greg Epstein over there on the end of the table. Uh, you guys probably all know Greg. He was born and raised in Jackson, and for 20 years he had a successful career in photography and film and video production, most recently working for for Teton Gravity Research as their head of production. Um, after surviving a near-fatal avalanche that we'll talk about in 2014, he decided to give back and ran for Teton County Commission and was elected in November 2016 and sits on that board. Thanks, Greg. Uh, Larry Hartenstein grew up skiing in the Poconos and the Catskills. He moved to Jackson Hole almost 20 years ago and has worked at Jackson Hole Sports um, for that entire time, 19 years, and he is now the general manager of hard goods and a, and a safety gear buyer. And um, he spends about 130 days or more skiing out at the village every winter, um, with about half that spending out of, time, out of bounds. And when he's not skiing, he's hiking like a madman. Thanks, Larry. 
Uh, Reed Finley uh, grew up skiing in North Carolina. He moved to Jackson 26 years ago, became a lifty at the village, and has been a river guide also on the snake up in the park um, for about that entire time. For the last 14 years, he's been a full-time ski patroller out at the village. And Reed is, when I think about Reed, I think of him as one of the silent assassins of the Tetons because he is getting out there, but you would, you'd never know from talking to him. So thanks, Reed, for being here. So kind of what I want to do to start this is just give these guys, give each of them about five minutes to explain what happened to them. Um, and we'll listen to that, and then we'll go into some questions that I have for them, and then we'll open it up to you guys as well. So uh, the important part is that this is an open dialogue. It's a discussion. It's, it's meant to be respectful and just uh, a place of learning and, and building all of our own awareness. So, Greg, you're pretty good at these things, so why don't you start us off? Start in the hot seat. Funny enough, I went to college with Jessica, and Reed was on my rescue. So it's, I'm in good company here. <laughs> anyway, uh, just to kind of get down to it, uh, March 9th, 2014, the day before March 8th was a super sunny day at uh, Jacksonville Mountain Resort. We skied the front side of the mountain just fun, slushy, it was warm, and it's ease facing. Um, so that, that, that temperature gradient definitely went up. Uh, overnight, it uh, became overcast, cooled down. We woke up the next morning knowing we were gonna go ski. And you know, maybe we were gonna ski just around the resort. Um, realized it was dust on crust. It said, well, let's go check out Granite Canyon. And for me, I probably been in Granite Canyon at that point hundreds of times and it skied all different aspects parts um, little routes whatever and still probably didn't know all of it but knew knew a lot of it anyway we decided it was probably about 10 in the morning decided to uh, go up and check out a an oblique shoot off of endless uh, we did a little hasty pit at the top and just to let you guys know, we, I did two, we did two runs. So my first run, basically, hasty pit, we ski cut a bunch of stuff, skied this oblique chute, and skied no problem. Um, the, the snow, nothing was really moving, felt pretty comfortable. And so we skied back around, got back to the front side of the mountain, and just had a little lunch, decided, you know, should we go for another one? And thought about it, said, yeah, why not? But in the back of my mind at that point, at least on the front side of the mountain, there was the ambient heat was coming up a little bit. It wasn't uh, enough for the total red flag, but it was definitely coming up a little. So we said, okay, well, let's go check it out. Let's go back up. And so we came down a little bit further to uh, a little bit more north and into a place called a football field, which then leads you into mile long and so again, hasty pit, ski cut, a bunch of stuff on the top of football field. Um, and if anybody that's been up there, it's pretty steep above football field and then football field kind of is this long, kind of smooth uh, field of snow. Anyway, same thing, nothing moved. Um, got back and kind of cut under the football field into what is known as double dog leg. And just to let you guys know, had my, my uh, team of skiers with me, all solid, two of them. One of them was a pro skier. The other one um, had also had my job before I had it. It also helped develop the risk management program at TGR prior to me, and then I followed up with that. Anyway, so I had experienced skiers with me. So, um, they were standing. In, their, um, in a safe zone on this little sub ridge, and I said, okay, well, I'm gonna ski cut this. So I ski cut it, and there was a grouping of trees. Again, nothing moved, and I had established my island of safety about 75, 80 feet down below me to the left. And I said, okay, I'm gonna make a turn, and as I made that turn, I think it was the second turn, I just saw it spider web in front of me, and I, I, and I immediately knew, I said, okay, I'm, I'm going for my island to safety. And I just started to peak the ridge 
and, it, and this snow caught the back of my skis and started ripping me downhill. And at that point, I was like, okay, well, just what's my training? What's my training? I had an airbag on. My goggles were over my face, so the first thing I did is I just grabbed my goggles and just pulled them up over my, fi over my helmet or whatever. And then I just said, okay, pulled my airbag, and it was, it was accelerating. And I'd you know, been in double dogleg a handful of times, and all of a sudden, boom, I'm in the air. And I was, I was thinking, I'm like, there's no cliffs that I know of around this spot. And uh, realized that the velocity of the slide had just pitched me over the dogleg. And so I was floating out in space, and at that point, I, I, I had no idea. I thought I was going to be I was done. I had enough time to think that my life was over. Hit impacted, immediately um, my leg or my ski hit a tree, leg was shattered, uh, and I was like, when is this thing going to be done? And I just kept getting, you know, it was slowing down, but it was still taking me down, and it ended up being about probably 12, 1,300 feet. Um, I ended up on top because I pulled my airbag, and at that point, I just started, I mean, I, I, I actually did two things. I, in the middle of the slide, thought I was impaled by a stick, so I took my hand and put it down my pants to make sure that I wasn't bleeding there, and then even though I was in tons of pain, I actually pulled my pants up around my leg and put my hands up underneath the uh, cuff of my pants to, to make sure that I wasn't bleeding there. And once I realized that, okay, I'm not going to bleed out right here, at least not, not yet, um, I just started yelling to my friends, call 911, because in Granite, you know, the guys I was with know, knew this, but, I mean, once you get far enough down, you're not making many phone calls. So at that point, that's when we initiated our rescue, and we can talk more about that. But uh, that's kind of how it all went down. Um, remind us the extent of your injuries. Yeah, you know? so I had a shattered tib fib on my right leg. I open booked my pelvis, I tore the abdominal muscles off the right side of my pelvis, I had a bunch of internal bleeding. Um, at the end of the day, I was in ICU for, I think, five, five days in the hospital for another couple of days, had eight or nine units of blood, and I'm really happy to still be here talking to you guys. Thanks. Same here. <laughs> um, yeah, and we'll go into questions after. And a lot of these stories, they're, a lot of, they're really deep, right? Um, but we'll get to them. So, uh, Reed, you want to tell us what happened to you? Reed, you were in an incident last winter. Rick? Yeah, last winter, I was just looking it up on the line. I've forgotten the exact date. It was January 28th of this winter, so we were well aware of the December drought layer. And we were deciding, you know, what could we ski on that day? It snowed, I think it was, it said eight or nine inches at the rendezvous bowl plot the night before. And there were a lot of winds associated with that. And, um, Anyway, I was with a person I work with at the ski area, and then this woman who's been a good friend for many years, and uh, we decided to ski this, uh, it's called Point 8602 up in Grand Teton. It's, it's on the north side of Webb Canyon, if anybody's been up there. It's this burn, you probably see it when you drive up the park, go up to Yellowstone. It's got all these dead trees on the east-facing aspect. I mean, it's still, it's a pretty gnarly looking slope, but you know, we were basing our decision on low, it was the, the hazard rating for the day was moderate at the low elevation, moderate at the mid, and considerable at the high. So I felt like, and I think the other folks felt like this would be something we could, we could do and um, you know, not get away with it, but just have a nice tour. And if there were any obvious signs, we would turn around. Um, so we drove up to the park, you know, not a really early start, but not a late start. And one thing I remember was seeing the temperature in the truck. It was 29 degrees. The temperature was supposed to rise that day, so snow was, I mean, the sun was supposed to come out. So I remember thinking about that. It was overcast. Uh, it did have that kind of muggy feeling, which in retrospect might have been a sign. Um, so anyway, we skied across the lake, and we actually, we didn't think we'd see anybody else up there, but we were following tracks of other skiers who were going up Webb Canyon, of all places. So anyway, we got up there. Um, I remember at the base of the actual climb, we got across the lake, kind of got to the base of the peak, started going up, doing a little hasty pit, and um, just finding that December, the crust layer down there with just a few inches of snow on top of that. 
So I remember just thinking, okay, you know, this is good if nothing changes for us. And uh, I, was, I was third, other people were putting in the track, and my whole thought, and I think we talked about this, was there's all these old burned trees. They don't have branches on, they're just these big hulks, blackened hulks from the fires in 2000 or 2001. And um, so we were going up the East Ridge, uh, about 30, says in the report, 31 to 34 degree slope, and we were just putting in the track, and the snow was starting to get a little bit deeper. I remember thinking that, and I remember clearly there were no wumps or obvious signs, no cracking or anything like that, so, and we never stopped and said, do you think this is crazy or is this strange? We were just kind of, I mean, we were just happy to be out because it had been kind of a rough season in the beginning, and we were starting to get some snow, but we hadn't got quite into the big snowfalls that we were seeing on the charts. So anyway, um, I think we were about three quarters, two thirds of the way up the slope, and I caught up to everybody, and it was my turn to break trail. And I remember I broke one Z or one uh, traverse line, switched back to start going left or to the south, and the snow was starting to get up to my waist. And I remember thinking, okay, this now that I'm really breaking trail, this feels kind of strange. But I didn't say anything. There was a big black tree right beside me. I just remember thinking, okay, if anything goes, this is my, my tree of safety. <laughs> so, uh, and I actually, just to go back, I had an airbag. I worked in France two years before, or the year before that, so I had an airbag, and the past two seasons, early season, I've been trying to wear the airbag. It's an older one, it's heavy. But I was like, ah, what, you know, might as well wear the airbag. It's considerable, moderate, moderate. And so I, at the bottom of the slope, I had, trig I had uh, armed it, it was ready to go. The other two weren't wearing one, but you know, we didn't think anything wrong of that. We definitely had our transceivers, they were on. And so we were just having a good time. And the next thing I know, as I made that cut back, and I'll never forget this, it was like the trees were growing. You didn't hear this crack. You did kind of hear a weird sound, but it's like all the trees just started to look like they were growing up. And it was because the snow was settling down and you, know, you could just see the base of the trees, the snow just leaving these little like, I don't know, little waves of little like flakes. And we were all like, whoa. And the next thing it was like this, and then like that. It just started off to the races. And you look at avalanches, you know, you look videos, pictures, all that, and you're always looking at them. You know, you're looking at a flat screen, or you're looking at them from above. You throw a charge and you see it just go over and that's that. But when you're actually in it, you see it's more three-dimensional. And so I just remember, I got kind of spun around into the slope, and I, had, I didn't have a whippet or anything, because this wasn't really a high-consequence slope. I put my poles down and just started trying to self-arrest, and then I was like, oh, I've got my airbag on, you know, within the first two seconds. So I just pulled that, and like someone said, it's like someone grabbed you by the neck, and just, I got spun around, face down the slope, got to watch my avalanche. And to me, it was like being when a boat flips in a river, and just all of a sudden, seeing all this snow go around you and see my two friends kind of go across the slope in front of me. And then if you've ever, you know, when you're surfing or wakeboard and you miss a wave, you jump up, and the wave goes under you, and then you land back on the sand. That's how it felt. I was like, well, this isn't too bad. But I was, I was going downhill. I did hit a tree in my thigh. I mean, I was very lucky, just Charlie horse. And then as soon as the snow, I mean, I could see the snow just ripping down through the trees, trees ripping, all that. And then it stopped, and I heard you know, the one person say, uh, my knee, I'm, you know, I'm screwed, I'm okay. And then the other person said, oh my God, I can barely breathe, and she was choking. So I, I lost the ski, I ran down to make sure they were all right. And then I just ran up, took a few pictures, because there was no burials or no, it was more um, trauma. So I remember thinking, God, I'm, I'm really lucky. And it was still early in the day. Uh, I was just impressed by the pressure of the snow, how fast it reacted, and the whole you're totally out of control feeling, but knowing there are all these uh, pins down below to catch me that you're gonna slam into. I got lucky, the other two, they did hit some, uh, some of the trees, um, and um, anyway. That was, that was my experience. Were you guys able to self-evacuate? Self we self-evacuated, there was a huge discussion. I used to be on search and rescue, and I was like, you guys, we should call. You know, they can come get us in no time. They can snowmobile across the lake. And this was at like 12.30 in the afternoon, or maybe two o'clock in the afternoon in January, so it was still light out. And 
and we had this discussion several times, and we decided to leave it up to the most injured person, and he was like, I can do this, I can make it out, I'd rather not call right now, just because, just and I was like, you know what, it's, let's, let's leave it up to him, if he wants us to call, we'll call, but we, you know, we put skis together to get ourselves out, um, we self-rescued, we got back at five o'clock to the, to the truck, but, um, you know, looking back, it worked out for us. We had all the gear, we had extra rope and stuff to make, so one person could walk on his two skis. I just, I had one ski on, that was probably the most painful part for me, but was post-holing every other step, you know, in like crotch deep snow, because it warmed up considerably, and going across, going across the lake was actually not bad, but, and for the other person who hurt his knee, the lake was actually the easiest. It was just going down diagonaling down. What I realized, I went up there this summer to get all my gear and some other gear that was there. I canoed across the lake by myself. It was a gully, a buried gully where the slide had occurred, which we couldn't see. And where the starting point was, it was just all this talus and gravel. Um, you know, not, not like big boulders, but just little talus that probably was a, it, it was a facet garden, basically, once everything had slid, so mm. hindsight. All right. All right. Uh, thanks for that read. Larry? Your turn, buddy. So uh, I'm an everyday skier at the village, as Matt was mentioning. I think that's part of my, my story is just having these, uh, you know, getting out to the same areas every day and believing that the terrain is going to be the same as the day before. Uh, it was the beginning of February. I think it was February 6th, 7th this past winter. I uh, was out with a partner. Um, I had been skiing all day. I just skied a uh, north-facing aspect out in Pinedale Canyon, then skied great. Uh, came back with my partner, um, caught up. It was about 3.30 in the afternoon. We went up the Teton lift and just got, decided to ski Air Force. And actually, my partner, this is the first time, I mean, he had skied Air Force before, but not directly off the Teton lift, so it was kind of a little bit more interesting for us. And we went out, um, skied away, that first little section in the trees, um, regrouped at, there's a big boulder in the middle that kind of splits a steeper aspect from a less steep aspect and had quite a bit of skier track on it. Sent my partner uh, down the right side, skier's right side, um, sent him, there's a crux kind of in the middle of Air Force, sent him to just below that so I can keep eyes on him the whole time. He got to that spot, everything was good. I. Looked uh, left at that steeper face. I had skied it two days earlier, and I said, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ski that. And as I started to ski over to it, I definitely kind of thought that it was a good chance it was going to slide on me. I don't know, premonition, or I uh, just got that feeling that day. So I went into it. I did ski cut the entirety of that left side. I then uh, nothing happened. I was you know, trying pretty hard to push the snow off. I think it was my third turn to my left and saw the you know, entirety of the slope to my left. I never got a chance to look to my right, but it propagated away from me, full spider webs. It was probably, I don't know, it wasn't that big. It was maybe 12, 15 inch uh, soft slab, but it was a considerable day. It had been um, probably, uh, at that point in the day, it probably was 3.30 in the afternoon that we were up there, and it probably was about 40 degrees. Um, so the snow was very, very heavy. Um, instead of trying, I was wearing an airbag, uh, instead of trying to pull my airbag, I tried to ski away from the uh, avalanche. Um, I wasn't able to, got pulled in, um, got thrown around, and then I ended up going with it for about a thousand vertical. Uh, ended up just up uphill of where my partner was at. Uh, during that thousand vertical, I was able to breathe twice. Um, I couldn't see anything. I tried to pull my airbag at least seven times, it might have been eight times. I was getting Maytag through that avalanche as hard as anything I've ever felt. Um, every time I tried to swipe for my trigger, I, I missed it or it was getting thrown around. Um, that was, a, as I think as Greg was saying as well, I had ample time to think about the end of my life and that my family would never see me again. Uh, I was definitely thinking about it as, as I was going. After I think that seventh or eighth pull, I just tried swimming to the top and somehow was kind of able to end, you know, get up a little bit higher, um, end up buried waist down. Um, I had torn my MCL a couple months earlier, so retweaked that pretty bad. Had both skis, I ski with my dins way too high, had both skis ripped off, both poles gone. Uh, luckily found, um, the first thing when I, when I did get out, I, I was just coughing out snow, I couldn't breathe. Uh, and and I, I heard my partner yelling something up to me, and all I could do was just scream. I, I couldn't talk, I couldn't say anything. Once I got that snow out, I was just like primally screaming. It was uh, pretty crazy. Um, was able to find one ski about 100 yards down and sidestep back down once I kind of, you know, my, uh, 
uh, all my systems were just in high alert. Um, finally got down to the traverse line in Granite, and my partner actually found my other ski down on the traverse line, so that helped quite a bit to get out. Uh, the slowest I've ever come out of Granite, the, I had zero energy left and just felt like I couldn't move at that point. Um, definitely, you know, uh, pretty messed up emotionally, but uh, certainly very happy to be alive and got out back to my store pretty late in that, that afternoon and um, just started thinking about all the mistakes that I made. And um, I have about 150 employees at the village that report to me and I make a big deal about not wanting to talk to their moms anymore. I've had a, a lot of employee deaths over the years, some skiing, some not, but I, uh, I had just lost my dad about a month and a half earlier, and I, I wrote a letter to kind of all my employees. It's kind of like one of you almost had to talk to my mom today, and that would have been pretty bad on her a month and a half later. So um, that's the third major avalanche I've been in, and um, I'm hoping to not have any more. So. Right. Well, thanks, Larry. Yeah. Jessica? Okay. What happened to you? <laughs> um, my incident happened back in 2007, so while I don't remember all of the circumstances, it's hard to forget what I do remember. Um, I had plans to meet a good friend of mine who was a ski patroller at Jackson Hole one, one day, and um, it was mid-morning, and I think while we both can't remember it's likely that she might have been coming off of duty, getting the mountain ready for the skiers that day. Um, and it was an incredible day. It was uh, low pressure, um, quiet, overcast, and um, like endless amounts of these huge snowflakes coming down from the sky that were light, and it was gonna fill in all day. Um, Based on my experience at that time, and I know regardless of what we were planning to ski, and also her experience being a ski patroller, um, I am fairly, com we, we weren't looking for any risks. We were just out to have fun and um, just uh, by default stay safe. And um, so whatever we were gonna ski was gonna be conservative or it, whatever, my approach is always I know that uh, that I'm fairly conservative. I know I was prepared. I know I had checked the avalanche report, although I can't remember the details of, of what that was that day. And I know that she had a, a very solid familiarity of the snowpack that year. Um, regardless, we decided that a untracked powder run in granite might was just the thing that day. And so, we headed up AV and um, through the gate and uh, over this low angle meadow and the powder, I mean, it was, it was nice snow. Uh, there was a lot of it and very few people had been up there at that time. It was mid morning again. Um, and we stopped at the top of Snack Shack Couloir and we were looking down, we decided to do what we do, which is ski one at a time and um, leapfrog. And she dropped in first and made some turns and then uh, kind of snuck in to the right on the side and let me know it was my turn. And then I went <clears throat> and I was skiing down and I could see that I had just passed her out of my peripheral vision and she yelled something to me. And I, I like slowed down and I started to look up and I was just hit with this incredible force. And I'll pause here because um, she could see everything from where she was. And what had happened was along that big, that meadow, uh, there was a group of skiers that were traversing to another chute in granite. And they were all skiing together and they let off a slough. And this slough just bottlenecked and came down on top of me. And I was in the wrong position for this massive amount of snow and um, and it overtook me and the next few seconds seemed like an eternity um, and I can best describe it as uh, like a just a crazy powerful recirculating hydraulic and I had no control over my body what my limbs were doing and absolutely no defense against any thing that 
you know, might have caused any impact in my path. Um, so luckily, there were no rocks, no cliffs, and no trees. And um, it went about 900 feet. And at the end, when it all stopped, I was standing up, and I was, um, <clears throat> I had like everything kind of ripped off of me, and my my throat was packed with snow, and um, I was pretty shaken up. I had no equipment, and um, there were two two guys on the lower traverse. I was almost, I was right above the lower traverse. Two guys coming for me, like just, <clears throat> like, are you all right? Are you all right? And my partner skied down to me, and um, we were just kind of getting our bearings, and she was really shaken up, and I remember being there for a few minutes, and then there was this group of ski skiers on the lower traverse skiing below us, and I remember my partner just losing it and, like, yelling out to them because she, she had recognized them as the people above us, and she wanted to get their attention to let them know what had happened, and there was... Like, either they didn't get it or they just didn't recognize what, what had just happened. And uh, anyway, that's the story. And it had a huge impact on both of us, um, my partner and I. Yeah. Well, thanks. Um, so I kind of want to ask you guys, uh, based on your experiences, what are some of the things that you do differently now when you go skiing? When you go out in the backcountry, are there? Is it a piece of gear? Is it the way? Is it your routine? Is it a checklist? Um, anything at all? Like, what's different now for you guys? Are you gonna go in the state, same order? Sure. Mm -hmm. To be honest with you, I think I've been in the backcountry three times since my avalanche, and most of it has been. I've been dealing with injuries. I mean, it's. And I'm, I'm, anybody that knows me knows how hard I've worked to get to where I am today. But it's been tough. You know, I, 2014, I didn't ski all of 2015. Came back, skied 2016, but w like wasn't thinking that backcountry was even an op that wasn't even a thing. I was like, I just need to get my skis under me. 2017 didn't ski, dealing with residual injuries, and then ended up skiing last year. And, um, that, and, and so really for me, it's been more about getting strong again, getting, feeling confident on my skis again, just, just feeling it and enjoying it for what it really is in, in what I would consider the safest environment right now, which is, um, in, in a ski area where it's, you know, where it's controlled and things like that. But that doesn't mean that I haven't thought about the backcountry a lot. I mean, I, I, it's some of my probably most memorable times in my life have been in the backcountry. But it's really been about battling injuries, getting strong again. And to be honest with you, it's not even that getting in another avalanche scares me the most. I mean, that's definitely in the back of my mind. But... I just don't even know that if I'm strong enough to ski some of the places where I'd want to go and ski. So that's kind of, that's where I'm at right now, and we'll see what 2018, 19 brings. Um, but, you know, I, I'm also enjoying my life, and I enjoy my wife and uh, my family and things like that. And I don't know if I, I mean, I, I had 30-something solid years of skiing hard and being in a, going to a lot of really cool places and skiing a lot of great places and a lot of good snow conditions. And I can enjoy skiing for what it is for me now. Well, thanks. How about you, Reed? Um, I am very lucky, obviously. I did not have any injuries. And I mean, as far as skiing, I'm still going into the backcountry and still doing what I did before, but with more awareness. I definitely, one of the people I was with, he really injured himself. He's basically destroyed his knee. And so I empathize and vicariously, I guess I'm kind of going through what he's been going through. And the other person, she, you know, she had some minor injuries, but she had some kind of, I guess, psychological injuries. And, uh, you know, I've just been listening more after the incident happened, but listening to what they 
have said about where it left them and trying to take that into my own uh, experience. But I mean, maybe because I didn't get injured, knock on wood, I'll never get injured. Um, I just, you know, I feel like I just need to be more situationally aware. The dysfunctional and you know, all the stuff we watched this morning, you know, just take that more to heart. Um, but also just use all the experience I've had before. And I mean, I'm a pretty adventurous person, and I think that's why the whole thing happened that day. Is like, well, let's let's go for some adventure, not like we're gonna show the mountains. You know, we're not like that at all. We're just like, well, let's just go for a nice tour. And I think I might try to tone that down a little bit more. I think for me, a lot of it became that an airbag only works if you can get to it, and um, I think talking to a lot of uh, different professionals at the ski resort, and um, I, I do buy um, hard goods and uh, um, avalanche gear as, as one of my roles at the resort. And I've been having conversations with some of my vendors about looking for more passive approaches to some of this avalanche gear, because as like I said, when I was getting thrown down the hill, I, I tried to pull my airbag a good seven times and couldn't do it. So um, that's something that I thought about. I, I did continue to ski the backcountry after my incident, um, I actually went back to the same couloir like maybe three or four days later, kind of felt like I needed to ski it, which was probably pretty stupid, um, but made it through it. So um, I think the big thing for me is, as, as Reed was saying too, just a situational awareness, and I knew I was making some mistakes that day. It was really warm, and um, but same thing, I had skied it two days earlier, and I skied it four days before that, and um, I think I'm trying to think about that. and. Um, again, the whole airbag thing, I, I'll go out with people without an airbag and I'll be like, well, I have an airbag on, I'll go first. Um, maybe that's not the, the best heuristic out there. So um, those are the big changes for me. And, and as Greg was saying, I'm, I've got a little boy and I've been trying to make sure that I'm thinking about him before I'm, I'm skiing something that's going to put you know, myself in harm's way or, or maybe some additional harm's way. So, cool. Thanks. Um, for me, I think I'm a little wary about side country at the resorts because there's a lot of people. I'm more likely to go low, low angle back country, mellow, just have a good day. But um, again, probably a, even a little bit more conservative <laughs> than I was. Um, and thankfully, I don't, I don't have time for big adventures. Um, so I think I'm, uh, just by the fact that I'm a mother with children, I'm always thinking about coming home within a couple of hours of being out, so it's different. You told me on the phone that it was, um, the takeaway for you was to not be in that situation to begin with. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think a lot of us, uh, I know that I kind of look at that and I, I think we all kind of feel that, but the option of not skiing oh. is kind of not an option. Exactly. You know? So what do you do when you're like, um, just choose different terrain? I, I mean, I think if I were to do it again, or if I were to approach a day on a day where it's filling in that fast, like that, um, I mean, just the, that was just a slough. It was just the weight of just a slough. And I was in the wrong position for that slough. But um, it was a circumstance that I wasn't in control of. And mm -hmm. the weight of all that light, beautiful powder was pretty heavy and it was moving super fast and mm. so it's not to be underestimated mm. even if the the base was solid and safe <laughs> um are there any questions out in the audience kind of open this up yeah Uh, but, but not to be a factor for the, the incident, the accident, 
Yeah, the question was um, about luck, essentially, and was the, was the avalanche a, a matter of bad luck or bad decisions? Under the circumstances that day, and you know, I've reviewed this in my head a lot, and knowing that we had skied something earlier in the day that was a relatively the same aspect, slightly different, but not much, it was the choice of choosing that particular terrain and the, the, that steepness of terrain at that time. So, I mean, when I skied the backcountry, I, I mean, I'm, I'm always thinking about avalanches. I'm always, I'm looking at the terrain and saying, if you hit that little knob, what's going to happen? If you hit that little compression, what's going to happen? If we, you know, this, that, or the other, you look at that slope. I mean, I'm always thinking about where, what, how is the snow going to move if it actually decides to break away? And so I, I wouldn't, I'm not going to, I mean, I would say it was bad luck, but I would also say that I could have not put myself on that piece of terrain that day, um, even though everything around us, all the other, you know, it, it just was one of those things. I mean, it was a considerable day. It's either or, nothing else had moved, nothing had even sloughed that day. I mean, that was the thing. So we said, well, this seems like it's okay. It's within the margin of error. Well, I ended up on the wrong side of the margin that day. So I, it's a little bit of both. Yeah, and looking back, I mean, obviously we made a bad decision. And I remember right when the slope, when the avalanche, the dust had settled, the snow had settled, and we were all together assessing the injuries and talking about what had happened. One of the guys said, "We just did. We ignored the history of the snowpack." And I'll never forget him saying that. And you know, seeing the slides for the DDL we had last winter, that was kind of the beginning of. What was gonna, what was to come? Um, I don't think. Well, luck did not play a part. Bad or good luck did not play a part in our decision. And that's, you know, that of course makes me look back to stuff where you just come home. And you're like, man, that was awesome. We had a, what a great day. Okay, back to work tomorrow. And this was not going to be like face shots over your head and awesome powder skiing. It was just going to be you know, just something, a nice outing in the park, come back, and that's that. Yeah. I guess for me, I just feel like if you're going to spend enough time in the side country, it's just inevitable that this is going to happen, and it's how, you know, I don't know that I feel like luck is really involved. I expect avalanches, and when people go out on a low day, and they're like, there's no danger. Like, no, it didn't say no danger. It says low danger, and I think that that happens a lot around here. Um, so I, I don't know. I think it's... Uh, a little bit more, like I, I equate it personally to like if you're gonna hike a bunch in Yellowstone, you're gonna have a run-in with a grizzly at some point. And hopefully that run-in doesn't go poorly, but it's a good possibility it will. So that's how I look at it. I'd have to agree. I think, um, yeah, I think on our particular in our particular situation, um, regardless of how prepared we were or how much we knew about the snowpack. I think we were a little hungry for those good powder turns, and we were going for the nice long run with, um, yeah, so. What do you guys think is the kind of one thing or two things that people don't really understand or appreciate about avalanches? Like, everybody in here is obviously aware of avalanches. There's a lot of really experienced people in here. Um, but until you get caught in one, I mean, what is the... What do we not, those of us who haven't been in an avalanche, what do we not know about it? I would say, A, the actual, actual power that that snow has. And I mean, for the slide I was in, it was about probably an eight or 10 inch crown, but because it was on probably 45, 50 degree slope, the velocity was, I mean, I was probably doing 55, 60 miles an hour like that. So it's the power. 
in, in, and then the volume of snow that just starts to build up. So I would say that's the number one thing. And I'd say the number two thing is, is that any one of us sitting in this room can get caught in an avalanche. I, there's, I mean, it happens even just at the ski areas. Things slough off of, of weird things. And I'm not saying that your probability is very high there, but I can say that we all need to pay attention and our, and our risk definitely goes up as we start to expose ourselves to, to uh, terrain that's um, not controlled, terrain that's steeper, terrain that's variable. It's, it's just how it goes. Yeah. Uh, for me, it was just the power of the avalanche. You hear that cliche all the time, but they're very powerful. And I guess I've never been in an earthquake before, but my analogy would be you're sitting here in this room and everything's stable and not moving. And next thing, everything you know about physics is changing. And that's, that was when I mentioned the trees growing. I was like, wow, that is really strange. And we had time, to, I had time to think about this. And then it was down and then down the slope off to the races. Um, and I probably travel from here to the back of the room, which, you know, is not that far. So I wasn't thinking, you know, really negative thoughts. I just remember thinking, well, I remember thinking this is going to be bad, just seeing the trees shaking off to the left. But for me, I didn't have negative thoughts. I was like, okay, here's this airbag. It's the brake. The brake, I'm stopping here. Here goes this big wave going down. And, um, and what, when I went back this summer, early summer, to get my gear and just to relive the scene of the crime, what we didn't realize is off to the south, there's these cliffs um, so most of the snow, I mean, we, we saw the end of the slide. We saw the debris down there, but I didn't realize how big these cliffs were at the time. So I went up there this summer, and the snow, the path, actually goes off to the right over, they're maybe third-class cliffs, something like that, maybe like 60, 40 feet high. But that would have been really bad, obviously, if, if we'd been in, caught in the snow and gone over there. But the trees actually stopped us. Um, I remember trying to hold on to the, this big burned tree and just... There was no way I was going to hold onto that, just getting pulled downhill. I think for me, it was uh, not being able to see and not being able to breathe, um, especially when I, I did finally come to a stop and, and trying to breathe again. I mean, it, it scared me to the core. So um, that was uh, mentally challenging. And um, a couple of us had talked earlier. I mean, definitely had some real PTSD for the next, um, probably the next week or so. I mean, I, I kind of skied through it. but. Very challenging, and uh, to Greg's point, the first avalanche I was in was uh, inbounds at Squaw uh, a bunch of years ago, a three-foot crown, and kind of same thing, kind of knew what I was getting myself into. I sidestepped as far as I could off of Red Dog, if any of you are familiar with that resort. Um, they had a four-foot storm overnight and just kept on going where nobody else had gone, and um, I got fully buried. I was fortunately out of it quickly and didn't get injured or anything, but, um, and we've lost you know, a few different skiers over the years at, at Jackson Hole Mountain Resort from inbound stuff for, you know, some before work, some during the day. So if you think that it's not a possibility inbounds, you're gravely mistaken. So um, can't mitigate everything. I would say the force of the snow and just, just the power of it all and how it fast it happens. And... Uh, I don't know if this pertains to the question so much, but just the um, the effect that the people around you can have on you versus like the decisions that you're making and the things that you're keeping in your control. <clears throat> you know, we're in a place where people are all over these mountains and I mean, even more, more and more every year. And it's crazy to think like all the, the impact that they could have on you. Yeah. So. Certainly a good point to remember that um, when you're skiing, dropping in on somebody or being below another group that's, that's dropping in too. Um, I think we're done. Matt, I'd, one, Getting one, the hook. Greg's got one. Just one more point. One more point. I, I, I would say that the, the last thing, and this is in your control, and this is before you even ever think about going skiing, is know your ski partners. Do they know how to do basic CPR? Do they know how to initiate a rescue? Um, do they know basic first aid or even advanced first aid? Because that's what's going to save your life out there. And that's really, really important. So make sure you're having those conversations before you even leave the house. It's easy. Awesome, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Give these guys a hand.
Thanks, Matt, for running an another great panel. Hey, thank you all for your time today. And uh, for those of us who are going to the pro session tomorrow, speakers, please be there at 8. Participants, please be there at 8.15. And we'll get started at as close to 8.15 as we can. There's limited parking at the search and rescue hangar, so please carpool. Please grab your, grab your uh, garbage, grab all your recyclables from your seat, and thanks for coming. See you at the brew pub. <laughs>